Uh, if ever there were a case where saying uh, I'm going to introduce someone who needs no introduction were true, this really is it. Uh, so I won't say much other than to say that we all know uh, David and know who David is. He's truly one of the most accomplished, successful, and just phenomenally talented trial lawyers, certainly of our time and, and probably of any time. It was a real pleasure working with him for the what seemed like very long time of the Microsoft trial. Uh, and uh, you know, as you know, that was only one of many, many, many uh, really important, really high profile cases in which he has made uh, a phenomenal contribution and a phenomenal uh, difference in the outcome. So uh, we're thrilled to have him here and thrilled to hear from him. David? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Well, anyway, now, there you go. It's, on. Uh, it, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years. Uh, it, uh, and it's, uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces. Um, the Microsoft case was, of course, many different things. It was a complaint, it was an investigation, it was an analysis, um, it was a negotiation, actually, several negotiations. It was uh, a, finally a remedy, a decree. But one of the things it was, and for me the thing that was most central, is that it was a trial. And in our country, every trial is really two things. It is a search for truth, and it is a morality play. And when you have an antitrust trial, those two things that every trial is are very interesting to mesh. Because the search for truth, particularly in an antitrust case, is inherently difficult, complex, ambiguous, data-driven, technology-driven. Uh, you've got to get into the details of very difficult industries, very difficult technologies. And the morality play has to go on at a very high level of generality. Uh, you try to adapt it, obviously, uh, to the case at hand. But by its very nature, it drives you from the data to the dramatic. And if you were designing a system in an entirely perfect world, you probably would not design a trial system that, was de that depended on it being a morality play. Now, every time we go back to the drawing board and try to figure out a better way to try cases like this, we look at the other places in the world where these cases are resolved, like the EU, and we come back saying, well, maybe the way we're doing it isn't so bad after all. <laughs> but that should not take away from the recognition that the way we do it is peculiar in terms of important decision making. If you, were, if you were sitting down trying to think of how are we going to make a decision as to whether, for example, the browser should be integrated into the operating system, you would not immediately spring to mind, well, what we're going to do is go in front of a general purpose judge who has no technological background, not really a lot of resources, uh, and we are going to have him make that decision based on an adversarial proceeding in which people come up and they ask questions and answers, and uh, nobody in that courtroom, other than the judge and maybe the court reporter, is designed to do something objective. The problem is that unless you have some alternative to the adversary system, some better alternative to the adversary system, what we're stuck with is a method of dealing with these kind of cases in a forum that in inevitably draws you to the dramatic, inevitably draws you to trying to make a morality play and teach the judge from your perspective. Now, luckily, in government antitrust cases, you are in front of a judge and not a jury. A lot of antitrust cases obviously are tried to juries. And so, if you take 
the limitations on a judge deciding a complicated economic, technological issue. And you add to that the less trained jurors, and then you deprive the jurors of every tool that you give the judge, like briefs, oral arguments, the ability to ask questions. All of the tools of decision making that you give a judge to sort of help him through this, you deprive a jury of. Jury can't get briefs, can't get written materials, can't ask questions. They just got to sit there and hope that their puzzled expression will lead you to figure out what it is is bothering them. So an antitrust case, and most antitrust cases are not government cases, most of them are private cases, most of them are tried to juries, and so it becomes even more of an emphasis on a morality play and less an, a, on the data and the technology and the science. But in a government antitrust case, at least you have a judge. But remember that the judge, if the judge is technologically trained, it is just random. Uh, it is, uh, the federal judges are designed to be general purpose jurists. They are not designed to be experts in any particular area. And just as an aside, whenever we have tried to get judges that are particularly expert in an area, like the federal circuit, where we try to put our patent cases and our intellectual property cases because other judges just throw up their hands with them, what you find is you find troubling uh, developments. Uh, you, you find the judges losing the broader perspective. Um, there is a reason why the Supreme Court, almost every time it takes a case from the Federal Circuit, reverses. And that is because the Federal Circuit has become, tends to become, too narrowly focused just on their particular subject matter. Uh, and so that even, that, even that solution doesn't work very well. So we keep, we keep being driven back to the idea of having a general purpose jurist decide these cases. And so how do you do that? We obviously try to persuade him. How do you try to persuade him? Well, like most human beings, they are partly persuaded by data, but they are also persuaded by drama. And so one of the things that you do when you're trying a case, even an antitrust case, is you try to simplify the issues. You try to make the issues real so that the judge can understand them and build on them. And when you have something that is particularly difficult and complex, the trial comes down to an increasing extent to an issue of credibility. And the reason is simple. Because if somebody is talking about how to make a sandwich, we all have experience making a sandwich. And we can, judge can, bring to that decision a certain amount of knowledge. He doesn't have to rely exclusively on what he's hearing from the witnesses and the lawyers. If you come down to the question of how do you make an operating system and how do you make a browser, that is not something that the judge or, frankly, the lawyers are going to figure out on their own. You're going to have to listen to people, and it is the nature of a trial that each side tends to find people who agree with them. And you tend to find fact witnesses that agree with them, you. You tend to find expert witnesses that agree with you, and you put those people on. And since each side has an opposing view, and each side has the ability to pick their witnesses, and each side, in a rational world, picks witnesses that agree with them, you almost always get two sets of witnesses, both well-educated, well-credentialed, uh, people of integrity, who come into court and say to the judge flatly inconsistent things. And so how does the judge choose between these things? The judge chooses, like most human beings choose, well, who do I believe? And part of that belief comes from admissions that you get on cross-examination. But a lot of that comes from what does the judge think about 
who's being candid, who's being direct. And as a result, when you have a witness that a judge concludes has a problem in terms of credibility, and that can be a real problem or can be an apparent problem, the effect is the same. As long as the judge concludes that the witness is not being credible on one area, that can affect that witness's credibility in other areas. And the more complicated the subject matter, whether it is economics or technology, science, medicine, the more complex the subject matter, the more credibility matters. You might think that credibility most matters in a non-science case. Was the light red or green? Was the person speeding or not speeding? In fact, credibility matters most in the most complex science-based cases because it is in those cases that the judge, and particularly the jury, if you have a jury, is less capable for deciding for themselves whether what the witness is saying makes sense or not. And those of you who lived through the trial know that there were a number of times in which you would have somebody's testimony that would go on for hours, sometimes days, and there would be only five minutes or ten minutes of that that would be reflected sometimes in a press report. And people would come out and say, well, that's very misleading. That didn't really reflect what the witness was saying. Uh, those were credibility points. They didn't really go to the heart of what the witness was saying. And there was a sense in which that is true and a sense in which that entirely missed the point. Because the point is that just like the reporter sitting there and trying to make sense of what's going on, the judge is sitting there trying to make sense of what's going on, and just like the reporter is focused on who do I believe, who's credible and who's not credible, that's what the judge is doing too. And uh, I can pick on Dean Schmalensee since he's not here. Um, and um, and uh, I mean, as, as most of you know, who, any, and anyone who knows Dean Schmalensee knows, this is one of the best economists in the country and one of the most effective uh, economic expert witnesses in the country. He is smart, he is articulate, um, he has had the good fortune to win the same prize that Frank Fisher won. Yes. The one for under 40. You didn't? That's what. Well, he says. <laughs> he, tell, he, he, he tells me he did. All right, see there. There you go. Now, now, if I'd only known that during the trial, think what I, think what I could have done with that. But um, except for that lapse in his resume, <laughs> um, he, he is somebody who is um, uh, a, a credible and effective witness. And most of his testimony, if you add it up, was credible, effective, balanced, and supported. But there were a few lapses in that testimony. Um, uh, one of them, for those of you who have the trial, remember, involved the Harvard Law, Harvard Law Review article. And uh, one of the arguments that we didn't really push at the trial, because I don't think um, uh, most of us had much confidence in it, and certainly Frank Fisher disagreed with it completely, was the idea that you could somehow infer some monopoly power from the fact that Microsoft made a lot of profits. Um, and uh, there may be at the core something to that argument if you could strip away the difference between economic profits and accounting profits and make all sorts of adjustments. I think Frank would say you can't inherently do that. Um, it was a issue, as I say, that none of us thought was the key to our case. Um, however, one of the questions that I asked Dean Schmall as he on the stand was, did he believe that high, persistent high profits were at least some indication of monopoly power? And he, like 
Professor Fisher, if he'd been on the stand, um, disputed that. Um, and indeed, he pointed out that Professor Fisher, also uh, my expert, um, uh, agreed with him that it was irrelevant. Uh, the, the problem was that I then showed him a document and asked him to read it. Uh, and what the document said was that persistent high profits was one of the three indications of monopoly power. And of course, he was the author of that article. And he got the article. He looked down at the article, sort of looked back up at me, and looked back down at the article, looked at me, shook his head, and said, what could I have been thinking of? <laughs> and that was an entirely candid response to a point of limited relevance to the case, but it was something that had a credibility effect in terms of, of how the judge and other people would look at this testimony. And that's just one example, and there are many examples in almost every trial, of where the credibility issues, the morality play issues, emphasize points that are not, strike are not, would not in an ideal world be the basis for decision making. And one of the, one of the challenges for judges and one of the challenges for lawyers on either side is to try to diminish the effect of these kind of uh, lapses uh, on the overall credibility of, of a witness. But when that fails, and when a judge gets to the point where the judge has a general dubiety about a side's credibility, that is when, particularly, in, in, and this happened, the more complex the case, the more this is true, the more difficult that side has a, has a, has a problem. And I think that one of, the, um, uh, one of the things that for a trial lawyer is interesting is from the standpoint of the trial as a morality play. From an antitrust lawyer, you're interested in what, is the, what does the case accomplish? And um, it, it always gives me uh, great pause to follow Doug Melamed in any discussion of antitrust law. And um, I think that probably what um, he told you at the end of the last session was a more articulate and concise description of what the, with one, with, with one exception I want to come to, um, of what the uh, case accomplished from an antitrust standpoint. Um, but from a trial standpoint, from a morality play standpoint, I think one of the things that it emphasized was the importance in a high-tech, complicated issue trial of what you know when you try a negligence case, a slip and fall case, an automobile accident case. Most antitrust trials are tried not like they were trials, but like they were some kind of academic investigation with people up there with a lot of boring charts and numbers and just a deadening um, impact on the trier of fact. And I think that one of the things that if you look at it not as an antitrust trial but simply as a trial that we did in the Microsoft case is that we treated it as a trial. We said, okay, how do we persuade? How do we take this issue, whatever the issue is, and persuade? From an antitrust standpoint, I think the one thing that I would, would add to what, what Doug said was that in addition to the substantive uh, advancements of antitrust law, I think one important antitrust accomplishment of the trial was to demonstrate that the government could indeed try a large, complicated case and that counsel and the court could bring one of those cases to trial in a reasonable period of time. I think that if you look at where we were 10 years ago, I think most people would have said, not only does the antitrust law have little 
high-tech industries, they would have said that Section 2 is almost a dead letter for a major uh, industry. Uh, the government morass of the IBM litigation, uh, I think, had led people uh, over time, uh, to some extent in an exaggeration, to believe that the government simply couldn't try a major Section 2 case. And I think that one of the things that the Microsoft case, not just the trial, but the case demonstrated, was that you could take a complicated government could take and they could bring it to trial on an accelerated basis and get to a, and get to a decision. And I think that that was a significant accomplishment in addition to the substantive accomplishments that, um, uh, that, that Doug uh, talked about. Uh, every major event in life, or almost every major event in life, has unintended consequences. And I think that when we think back on the Microsoft case 10 years later, I think in addition to thinking about what does it teach us about trying complicated cases, what does it teach us about trying antitrust cases, what does it teach us about development in antitrust law, we also need to focus on what does it say about the unintended consequences of this particular case. One of the unintended consequences of this case was that a case that started out as essentially a Section 2 case, an attack on using the browser integration to attempt to forestall competition to the operating system, a theory that only made integration important if the whatever code or whatever it was that was being integrated could serve as the basis of new competition has gotten transformed in, in a lot of people's minds into an attack on tying, technological tying, bundling itself. And, and you heard that a little bit this morning in terms of Microsoft, because Microsoft is worrying about do we integrate antivirus um, software? Now, antivirus software doesn't have any, at least, I mean, maybe it does, I, but I don't, I, I don't think, and no one has ever suggested to me, that antivirus software has any capacity um, to generate new competition for the operating system. And um, if that's so, the um, thrust of, the, of the, the government case ought not to have affected that. But it does, and I think one of the, one of the unintended consequences, and this, is partly an un, and this is partly a consequence of the transformation of a construct to an implemented trial in which you lose a lot of the fine tuning, you lose a lot of the fine distinctions. Um, the, uh, I mean, a, a number of times, you know, after, after a day in, in court, Doug and I would talk, and, and he would say, well, that's not what our case is about. And, and he would be right in one sense, um, in the sense that that's not what our case theory was. But it, it fit together with the morality play aspect of how we were presented. It helped somebody, at least in my view, put things into context. And so the very process of a trial, tends to take a carefully constructed and analyzed complaint with a theory, and then it implements it in a much grosser way. And that also, and that can lead to confusion at the end as to, well, what does this result really mean? And that can lead to, uh, I mean, we were, we were very careful, as, as Doug has said, not to allege that a zero price, in effect, was a tie. Not to allege that the mere fact that something had been integrated without a separate price was an illegal tie. Um, and yet, uh, if you have something like antivirus software and you have brought it in 
and it has no competitive effect on the operating system. It may obviously have a comp competitor effect on the people who produce antivirus software. But if it has no competition effect, um, it is not something that was contrary to the theory of the case. And yet it is something that I think in, in, in practice um, uh, is affected. Another unintended consequence is what's happening in the EU. Um, I think that what's happening in the EU has probably a number of, of, of root causes, and including some of what we were talking about at, at lunch in terms of the diminished capacity of our Justice Department to uh, influence what happens um, uh, in Europe for a variety of reasons. But if anybody um, had said at the time that we were discussing filing the complaint, well, the result of this is going to be um, the kind of fines and orders that you're getting out of the EU, um, I think that probably the predominant effect would be that if that's going to be the end result, we're not sure that the interim result that we're trying to achieve here in the United States is on balance justifiable. And so one of the, one of the unintended consequences of, um, of this, I think, is what is, was generated uh, in the U EU and, and how that has, that has developed over, over time. Uh, I think another, um, another um, unintended consequence, but an inevitable consequence, is to make um, uh, every uh, company in this kind of position, and not just Microsoft, but every company in this kind of position, who now has a higher recognition that their, com their um, conduct may be challenged, uh, more bureaucratic in terms of decision making. Now that's not necessarily bad. I mean, bureaucracies are not necessarily bad. I mean, bu bureaucracies can be good when they are accomplishing something. Um, uh, most of the federal government is a bureaucracy, and the federal government does a number of things that are good. Um, uh, contrary to some people's <laughs> points of view. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and one of those things is it can enforce a certain consciousness of power and responsibility. But it can also enforce a certain caution. And uh, one of the things that uh, I saw uh, in the case of IBM is after the IBM case, and it doesn't make any difference whether you win or lose that trial. You go through a trial like that, and you're a big company, and it doesn't make any difference whether you win or lose the trial. IBM went through this long trial, and they won the case. And yet it still had an enormous effect on the way that company thought about uh, decision making for a sustained period of time. Now that tends to, to wash out over eventually. But for a large number of years, just the process of that litigation changed the way the company was prepared to go out and compete. Um, now when that change is to recognize the responsibility that comes with power and to recognize that you can't just do something because you have power, that's a good thing. But when that comes to say, well, we really don't want to go through this fight again. And so it's easier to compete a little less hard. It's, it's a little easier, um, not to pick on the example, but it's a little easier not to put the antivirus uh, software in. Um, that is something where you do risk the antitrust laws having a consequence that is not only unintended, but actually contrary to what the antitrust laws were designed, designed to promote. Um, now, the unintended consequences are not, in my view, a reason not to bring antitrust cases. But um, they are, I think, reasons to understand what the cases are, to spend the kind of care that I think really was spent um, in framing the the uh, Microsoft case, and to try to be sure that the lessons that are learned from that case are lessons that are described, discussed, uh, advocated in as responsible a way 
as the case was originally generated. There is a, there is a sense in which when you finish a case, everybody's over and through with it. They, they, now they want just the headlines. Uh, they don't spend the time sort of analyzing it, and by they I mean people in antitrust enforcement agencies, people in the private sector. I mean, you, they do that in law schools and places and, and, and economic schools. But um, those of us who are actually doing it, when we're through the case, we tend to be through with it. We tend to move on. And the Microsoft case becomes about design integration, about uh, monopoly uh, power. It, it, doesn't bec it doesn't get into the detailed analyses that uh, everybody went through at the time of deciding to bring the case. And so I think we, you, you can reduce some of the unintended consequences by antitrust enforcement agencies and the private bar spending the same level, or if not the same level, at least additional level, of detail and importance and concentration on how they explain and what they take from the case that they do in putting it together. I think that um, if you uh, sort of packaged exactly what Doug said about the case, um, and if people could spend 10 minutes as opposed to 30 seconds on thinking about what the consequences of, of the Microsoft case is, we would all be better for it. Competition would be better for it. The antitrust laws would be better for it. And you would have less unintended consequences. Um, I'm always more comfortable taking questions than I am talking, uh, either taking or asking. <laughs> um, so um, uh, uh, Phil says that we, if I stopped at this point, we'd have time for some questions. Absolutely. Uh, I heard some speculation that as a result of the IBM antitrust case, when they introduced the PC, they didn't want to make it a closed architecture, and they didn't want to bring their own operating system, which they could have written. Instead, they hired, they tried to hire uh, digital research didn't succeed in doing that and instead hired this uh, small startup, uh, which eventually became the defendant here. Um, well, I, I, think, I think there is um, there, there's some that's right and, and some that, I mean, I, I think actually what you said is not correct, but I think something that's, that's related to it is correct. Um, uh, IBM uh, did not, was never, I think, going to write the operating system for the PC itself. Um, uh, it wanted, it, it was behind Apple, it wanted to catch up. Um, it had a large organization that did not move quickly. Um, it wanted to subcontract um, all of the components, and it essentially did. It essentially subcontract, subcontracted both the hardware and the software. And they actually brought that product out extremely fast, and then did what IBM was extremely good at, which was marketing. Um, the thing that is, that is related to that, though, is that uh, the question is not why did IBM choose to subcontract. There were many reasons to do that. The question is why did they let Microsoft keep any rights to this product? I mean, you had this enormous company, IBM, with this enormous monopoly power. Um, uh, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, but they, had, they, had a lot of, they did have a lot of money. Uh, and they were very large. Microsoft was very small. Uh, this was a very important contract to Microsoft. Why didn't IBM just get, keep all of the rights? And the answer there is the antitrust laws. Because there, what they were concerned about um, was uh, whether or not that would be viewed as something that they, um, they, they made the decision that they wanted to license the product. Um, uh, Apple, of course, except for a very brief um, an unsuccessful late venture in terms of licensing their software has kept their software to themselves and marketed only with their hardware. IBM thought that the way that, and, and antitrust lawyers may not have believed in network effects, but I can tell you IBM and Microsoft too understood network effects a long, a long time. And what IBM understood is that if they could get a lot of independent people producing the hardware and using the software, the software um, would uh, benefit from network effects. And so what they wanted to do was to get that out as broadly as possible, as fast as possible. They were going to license it. And what they were concerned about is if they um, didn't allow 
uh, Microsoft to keep the right also to license it, uh, that they would have uh, antitrust problems. So I think that there is, there is a sense in which not the decision to subcontract, but the decision as to how that license was written was affected by the antitrust laws. And, and IBM's kind of concern, um, having just recently been the product of, of a anti large antitrust case, how to avoid that. Speaking for myself, but the, uh, from the uh, the perspective of, of the uh, someone in the judges' chambers, I, it, it always sort of puzzled me why the government never had a counter narrative to the uh, notion that uh, software products consist of code and nothing else, and that there wasn't really a very strong narrative uh, 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 about, uh, you know, this is a case about products constructed from intellectual property, uh, that, uh, you know, Windows 98 users didn't, weren't buying code from Microsoft. Uh, because this, this uh, category error, that software products are the same as software or code, really lay at the heart of the uh, Microsoft 2 decision in, in uh, uh, the DC circuit, and, and ultimately was the the uh, reason for the rejection of, of Judge Jackson's uh, finding of, of the browser market. Uh, you, you know, you can't take the proposition that, this, that these are intellectual property constructs seriously and at the same time characterize the uh, benefits that you get from the extension of the OS and the, the new APIs. Uh, you can't attribute those as benefits of bundling the operating system and browser products together. And so I, you know, I think a great deal of the outcome in the DC circuit could have been different if, if the narrative had been different and it, there had been some explicit recognition of the intellectual property uh, dimensions of the case. I, I think that's possible. I think that one of the reasons for the uh, de-emphasis of, uh, of the browser market um, and the relative paucity of evidence in that case is that um, uh, the key allegation of the complaint, the heart of the complaint, was not the browser market but the operating system market. Um, I, from a standpoint of simply the browser market, um, if you look at market share percentages, Netscape had a monopoly. Microsoft came in and took a, most of that away, although Netscape, even at the time of trial, had a larger market share than anybody else had had a few years ago compared to what Netscape had. And the, the idea that there was um, a monopolization of a browser market, I think, was always something that um, uh, from an analytical standpoint, as opposed to the morality play, how you try this case standpoint, was always something that I think we had a lot of, of Dubai, some of us at least had Dubai about. Um, and um, uh, and in, any, in any case, what you, what you try to do is you try to focus on what the heart of your case is. And the heart of our case was a monopoly maintenance case. And um, I think if the heart of our case had been a browser market case, we would have tried it differently. Uh, and we might very well have, have done some of the things that you suggested. But um, although given, given some of our uh, arguments on um, Microsoft's intellectual property defenses, um, which we didn't know were almost frivolous until the Court of Appeals told us, <laughs> um, and uh, which we took seriously, um, we didn't want to do um, uh, something that would, in effect, emphasize the intellectual property character of this as opposed to the monopoly maintenance character of it. On a somewhat personal note, what are some of your favorite memories that you take from the whole experience? Are there any in particular, like during the trial or anything that you just say, God, I really, I loved that moment? or? Well, I mean, I, 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 I like the, um, the Schmolensee. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I, 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 I like the moment when, when, when Schmalzi told me um, that um, Microsoft didn't know what its operating profits were because they kept all of their statistics on handwritten pieces of paper. Um, the, um, uh, I mean, there, there were, I mean, I mean, if you think about my favorite moments, you will, you will quickly see that they really don't go to the heart of, of what we're, we're doing because um, uh, uh, I think of myself as somebody who knows something about antitrust law. I do not think of myself as something who knows anything about, particularly about computers. Um, but although I do know something about antitrust law, I mean, what I fundamentally am is a trial lawyer. And for me, the case was a trial. And, and so the moments that I sort of think back on and smile are the moments of a trial, not necessarily the moments where you made a particularly insightful analytical point about um, how um, the integration of the browser was maintaining monopoly power. There were a couple of those. I mean, there were a couple of those. Um, uh, uh, particularly during, for example, my examination of Paul Moritz, in which um, uh, I had no morality play uh, moments. I mean, uh, I mean there, was nothing, there was nothing out of Moritz that I could get that would sort of um, uh, be interesting to a general audience. But there were, there were a number of, uh, two or three, um, uh, concessions that he gave me that were building blocks to our uh, actual antitrust case. And, and you do, you do appreciate that at the time. Uh, nobody else does. Uh, the, um, uh, but um, uh, the most fun are the sort of uh, moments where you are able to take something and make it alive and convey to the court uh, the credibility point, for example, or some other point that you're trying to that you're trying to make real. I mean, the um, I mean things like um, uh, the Alchin tape, uh, um, uh, several aspects of poor Mr. Rosen's testimony. Uh, I mean, where you know where not things that really went to the heart of the of the case, but were the kinds of things that trial lawyers. You know, sort of enjoy. Uh, Mr. Mertz's testimony was seemed to be an exception when it came to the Microsoft executive witnesses, in that he seemed to be actually effective in explaining his emails and putting them into a context, and not seeming to uh, run away from the plain meaning of the the words in the emails. And he seemed to come away with a lot of credibility. But that was an exception. I think with respect to the Microsoft witnesses, that it was one thing that was striking, I think, in the trial was the, the surprising uh, inability of, or the, the way in which the Microsoft executive witnesses did not seem prepared to explain the things that they'd written in emails in ways that um, both preserved their case and made them look credible or retained their credibility. Uh, and that, I think, was surprising. At least it was surprising to, um, uh, people working in the judges' chambers, I think, was surprising to a lot of the observers of the case. Was it surprising to you? And if so, at what point in the case do you remember a point when you you recognized the pattern that that these Microsoft witnesses were coming in and uh, were not being able to put their uh, their clear words in context? Um, I don't think I ever sort of um, recognized a pattern and said I could count on that. Um, the, um, and, and I think it was more a, uh, a series of unrelated points and even unrelated in terms of cause. I mean, the, the uh, credibility issues with Schmolensee were quite different than the credibility issues with Alchin and quite different from the credibility is issues of Rosen and things like that. Um, each were tripped up with something that were not related to what the kind of thing that trips somebody else up. Um, and um, uh, I think that it, it's, it's difficult to know and to attribute exactly what, um, what caused that. I have, 
I have said before that there came a point in the trial that I was convinced that somehow Mary, my wife, had gone off and just sort of slipped people money or something to make me look good in court. Um, <laughs> because um, you, you could not have predicted some of the opportunities that I got. Um, but um, uh, I think another explanation is that I think we were trying two different cases in that courthouse. Um, I think that um, Microsoft was trying, if I, if, an old-fashioned antitrust case um, in which you come in and you make, and if you, if you step back from it um, and you simply put the testimony of the Microsoft witnesses into another trial, a lot of the trials that have taken place in antitrust over the last 50 years, um, they wouldn't have seen that unusual. I mean, it, um, uh, people making the same kind of arguments about not necessarily emails, but documents and data. Um, uh, what it was, in part, was I think that the witnesses were not ready for the cross-examination that focused not on is this data point right? Is this really the right code? Is this really the technological effect of doing this? We did do that to some extent. But we also focused on uh, credibility issues. And, um, and I, can, I can remember, uh, we, we had this um, uh, interesting procedure by which um, at the end of every day, um, uh, lawyers would go out and talk to the press and explain to the press what had just happened. Um, and uh, there, there, there came a point where I remember Bill Newcomb saying, well, Mr. Boyce is just focusing on issues of credibility. He's not focusing on, on the, the central issues of this case. And, um, and I, I, thought that, I, I thought that was unfair. Be, uh, because I did think that I was focusing on the central issues of the case. But it also was true that I was focusing on issues of credibility. And I think that, I think that a lot of what happened was that the, the Microsoft witnesses were not prepared for the morality play function of a trial. Thank you very much. Thank you.